This is Winchester Academy. I was in my daughter's, not granddaughter's, kitchen last weekend, and she and her mother were talking about something, and I couldn't understand it. But what are you talking about? And she, Sarah, turned to me and said, oh, Kevin Knapp still tunes my piano, and he's coming next week, isn't that cool? And I said, yeah, that's very cool. So, I'm thinking about Kevin Knapp. He's a teacher. He's a musician, he's a piano tuner, I don't know what all else he is, but he's also a very cool guy. which I used for uh, the background material on my talking about Rembrandt, the painter. And uh, then he also lent me uh, Pascal Bonifo's wonderful monograph on Johannes Vermeer. Uh, shout out to my longtime friend John Ryan for tracking down all kinds of books all over the country and the world, as well as Judy Phelps for sharing Tim's Vermeer, which if you're a fan of Vermeer's painting, it's essential watching. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, also, thanks to the Opaca Library for tracking down uh, Girl with the Pearl Earring, a wonderful film on Johannes Vermeer and the painting that I'll show images of. Um, most of the images I'm going to be showing are from my own camera. Uh, a few of them were scanned from books I have. A few of them, uh, out of necessity, were uh, brought from the internet. And those will be smaller, but they shouldn't be pixelated. Um, I, I put this image up because uh, this was on the sidewalks of New York, uh, and they have these bronze placards. And uh, apologies for the Rene Descartes uh, non-political correctness, I guess, but in the uh, 17th century, I guess it's excusable. Um, this makes me think of a, a tale about a year ago. I was uh, going to a bistro to pick up a chimichanga for Mary and I, and I was finishing uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, and I heard, as I walked in, a couple of 20-somethings whispering to each other, look at that guy, he's bringing a book into a bar. I can't believe it, I haven't read a book since seventh grade. Oh, I haven't read a book for 17 years. And then they immediately pull out their smartphones and start texting their friends about this idiot who brought a book into a bar. And, uh, okay. Uh, the, the reason I bring that up is that uh, one of the themes of my talk uh, is going to be digital technology versus traditional technology. And, uh, uh, <laughs> sure. Thank you. There we go. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> this is uh, rather odd. I've known Chris for a long time. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I have uh, made my living as a piano tuner for about 30 years. I have tuned 30,000 pianos and counting. And uh, it's what I do to make a living. And uh, uh, when I started tuning, about 1986 was the year that Yamaha came out with the Clavinova, which is a digital keyboard. It's not a piano. And uh, when I... It seems like I'm not being heard. Yeah. You're fine, okay, good. Um, 
in any case, when I started tuning, every little town had an elderly piano tuner, and most of them had made their, uh, learned their trade in piano factories in Milwaukee and Chicago. And there were still a handful of really great American piano companies, uh, Wurlitzer, Kimball, Baldwin, a number of others were still existing in Illinois and uh, the Midwest and New York. Um, but the advance of digital technology has basically usurped that the, the beautiful traditional instruments that the pianos are. Um, my father was also a piano tuner. I apprenticed with him. And he learned from this gentleman, Dr. William Gray White. This photograph is from about 1919, the year my father was born. Dr. White uh, had a school for piano tuners in Chicago from 1920 to 1960. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a founding member of the British and the American Acoustical Society. Um, he also, his books are still in print on, on the subject. And everything I learned comes basically from Dr. William Gray White. And piano tuning is both an art and a science. It's an art in that it involves knowledge, wisdom, and intuition as to where to put the uh, where, how to put the tension on the, the scale of the piano. And it's a, it's a science because it involves a thorough understanding of the mathematics of the musical scale. Um, I show this image of the Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Exhibition in 1893, uh, because this was a heyday of American piano manufacturing. Uh, if any of you have ra read Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City, uh, it's a great portrayal of what it took to put Chicago on the world map. Uh, the Paris World's Fair had just happened. The Eiffel Tower was built. Chicago wanted to rival New York for one of the great metropolises of America. And uh, at this time, whoever uh, the Ferris wheel was also created and invented for the Chicago World's Fair. At this time, whoever won first prize in the Chicago Columbian Exhibition would immediately have a in-demand product for pianos. And you have to recall that at this time there were no TVs, there was no cinema, there was no radio. Pianos were everybody's home entertainment center, basically. And it happened that W.W. Kimball won first prize at the Chicago Columbian Exhibition. They immediately were very much in demand. Ah, uh, sure. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully that'll be a little bit better. Um, and uh, Kimball's, in their century plus of existence, made over a million pianos. They, they made pianos from probably 1860 to 1992 when they finally closed shop. Uh, I show this to bring the connection between art and, and music and pianos to the fore. Myself being a visual artist and a piano tuner, I've always been fascinated with connections between art and music. Uh, Mrs. Kimball would spend some of the Kimball uh, family money in Paris uh, on leisurely trips and would buy paintings like Claude Monet's, uh, of, uh, I don't know exactly what this is called, but it's a beautiful painting in the Chicago Art Institute, uh, possibly Edward Manet's painting. Uh, George Seurat's Sunday Afternoon in the Park, um, and a Vincent van Gogh self-portrait. She would go to avant-garde galleries in Paris and, and spend the Kimball money, later bequeath them to the Chicago Art Institute and the people of Chicago and the people of the world. So that's an interesting connection between pianos. This is a uh, piano that I used to own. It's a great American piano, Conover Cable, and it shows uh, the components of the piano, because I took the front boards off, the, the pianos are really a product of the Industrial Revolution. Without modern casting techniques, string technology, milling technology, uh, the piano could really not come into existence. This piano was built around 1903. And you see the, uh, the plate, uh, the action, the beautiful ivory keys, as well as the, the harp. The, the harp of the piano really is the plate. Um, on a piano, there's 20 ton of tension strung over the 230 strings. So tuning a piano involves very precisely putting mathematical order on the frequency of the strings. Uh, there's a quote that my father's teacher, Dr. William Ray White, uh, introduces his last chapter on piano tuning. It goes, 
A quality piano, professionally tuned in a laboratory setting, will retain relative perfect intonation for a 24-hour period. <laughs> <laughs> I often use that when I get callbacks on my tunings. <laughs> but what, what that's really saying is that any piano tuner who is really honest with themselves realizes that you never quite achieve 100% mathematical perfection. Uh, it, it's, it, it doesn't really exist. And that the minute you tune the piano, the forces of entropy begin to uh, diminish the mathematical order that you put on the frequency of the strings. The forces of entropy in a piano are uh, the stretch in the strings. All strings go flat over time. Uh, the percussive effects of playing uh, start to diminish the, the, the mathematical precision. As, and probably the biggest factor is the humidity fluctuations in the, in the environment that they're in. Um, an example of that, for me, I got a call about 25 years ago um, from an octogenarian grandmother near Red Granite. And uh, her, grandmother was coming up, her granddaughter was coming up from Chicago to play for her birthday. And she wanted the piano to sound good. And I went, walked up to it, the beautiful Mel Branson upright, and I played a chord and I said, whoa. <laughs> This piano was really out of tune. Do you remember when it was last tuned? And she said, yes, November 17th, 1937. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that piano probably had, instead of 20 ton of tension, like maybe 12. <laughs> and, and luckily, it was the last stop of the day. I proceeded to give it about three tunings, brought it up to pitch, added some, a lot of tension to the scale, and it was passable. It maybe held its tuning for a week or so. But um, the forces of entropy over time diminish the, the, the mathematics in the musical scale. Um, because I'm a visual artist, I, I did some drawings from this piano. This is the uh, drawing of the uh, check straps of the action. And these are in graphite. Um, this is a drawing of the pins. And uh, I'm also a drummer, as many of you know. And uh, this was a drawing I did of my slinger and snare drum. And there's a reason why I'm showing these. This is a drawing I did of my grandfather's violin, who was a barn dance fiddler around the Manawa area. Um, because I showed these two because a, a piano is both a percussion instrument and a stringed instrument. It's really the only one uh, in the uh, family of instruments. And a keyboard is neither a stringed instrument or a keyboard instrument. It's kind of a soulless tone emitting tone emitting diode, as I like to disparagingly <laughs> refer to them. Um, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if Barb is here tonight. Barb Hahn, a long, long time friend. Oh, there's another Barb. You'll, you'll relate to this Barb. Um, a while back uh, at uh, Hope UCC near Fremont, Barb was a long time pianist there. And uh, uh, a young, went behind the years pastor went and spent $4,000 of the parishioners' hard earned money to a music store and bought a digital keyboard and unceremoniously rolled the venerable Everett console into the closet oh. um, without telling anyone. And Barb walked in Sunday morning to play at church, and this is an exact quote to what she told me. You're going to roll that Everett piano back in the sanctuary and call Kevin Knopp next week to get it tuned, or I'm not playing in this church anymore. Wow. <laughs> um, and the Everett and the keyboard are still sitting there to this day, and I tune the Everett once a year. Uh, I'm going to show a few examples of art and musical instruments. This is a 19th century William Harnett trompe l'oeil painting of a violin. It's a Pablo Picasso synthetic cubist assemblage of a guitar. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, this is some jewelry made out of piano parts. <laughs> And this is a deconstructed piano in a Berlin, Germany gallery. Wow. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. Um, my art of piano tuning goes back to Pythagoras. He was a Greek mathematician who lived on the Isle of Samos in the 6th century BC. And the, the myth is that Pythagoras was walking by a blacksmith shop and he heard the melodic sounds of the metal being hammered and he thought that there must be a mathematical relationship to the, the tones that I'm hearing. And he thought kind of um, misguidedly that the size of the hammers would determine the sound and the pitch that resulted from the hammering. And so this led to um, him inventing the monochord. This is an image on the Chartres Cathedral of Pythagoras 
playing a monochord. A monochord is an amplified string, basically, with, that you can um, fret at different intervals of halves, um, thirds, sixths, octaves, and, and, and these terminologies are, are important for the checks that I use today in tuning pianos. Uh, again, tuning pianos, if you could all just listen very carefully, that's concert pitch, A440. I do not have perfect pitch, but I have pretty good relative pitch. I need that reference point because piano tuning is a science. It needs, every pitch is either right on or sharp or flat, essentially. But it's more complex than that because I start with this pitch of A440 in the center part of the piano. And first you uh, establish uh, the center octave, which is called laying the bearings. And I'm sure you all are familiar with Johann Sebastian Bach's well-tempered clavier, uh, where basically you can, uh, equal temperament means you can play equally well in any key if you can transpose. And uh, there were other tuning systems, like the mean tone system, which you can only play in C and G and other, other uh, keys that did not sound good. Uh, so equal temperament and tuning is really a, a, an egalitarian metaphor. Um, it doesn't give preference to one note over another. So you establish the relationships in that center octave and you extend them up and down the keyboard very precisely, uh, <coughs> positioning the mathematics. And, and again, it's not as, quite as simple as that. This is where tuning, you become more masterful as you do it. Uh, it involves knowing how, where to position the strings because the soundboard of the piano which you'll notice on this image, the strings are strung over the bridge. The, the strings vibrate at a certain frequency. That frequency is transferred via the bridge to the soundboard and amplified. That's what creates the sound of a piano. So that soundboard is a very thin spruce membrane that has a crown on it. So when you add tension, it affects the frequency of all the other notes. So really, it, it's not a, a matter of fact entity. It's an intuitive process that piano tuning is. Uh, all pianos have a harp in them, essentially. It's, I'm going to trace the evolution of the piano. Uh, harp is a stringed instrument with a very small soundboard that is plucked. Uh, this is a piano with a literal harp inside in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, this is a harpsichord, which was a precursor to the modern piano. The difference between a harpsichord and a piano is that in a harpsichord, the strings are plucked with plectra, and there's no steel, there's no cast plate. So to create a dynamic difference in a harpsichord, you have to engage one or two or three banks of strings. And with a piano, you have dynamic variation at your fingertips. Uh, I'm going to read a quote of Charles Rosen here, um, a great interpreter of Beethoven. The greatest interaction between the keyboard instrument and the process of composition begins with the invention of the pianoforte in the early 18th century. The new instrument gradually asserted its supremacy over the harpsichord for use in public halls. It was the only instrument that could both realize the entire musical score on its own and at the same time call into play all the muscular effort of the body of the performer. And that's the percussive effects of the piano. If you see a great pianist or a blues pianist, their whole body is involved and that's because it's a very percussive instrument. Um, Bartomol Bartolomo Cristofori uh, was an English inventor, and he invented the first modern piano action, which you can see at the bottom. Very important development in the history of pianos. This was Mozart's piano, or one of them. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, this is a two-keyboard Bersendorfer, and a Viennese piano. And there's some music that can only be played on this piano, because um, you can play so rapidly between the two keyboards. Um, I'm showing this image because I'm going to start talking about the connection between the oral and the visual spectrum. This is a cyanom, uh, cyanograph. It was uh, invented in France in 1789, and it was used to measure the moisture content of clouds. Um, and for me, it's a very gradated, incremental visual analog for in a sense what you do when you tune a piano because you have to have all the increments equally divided, very consistent. And uh, for me, it, it, I really 
relate to this image. Uh, this is the light rays of the sun in a total solar eclipse. And I'm going to start talking about some connections between the two, uh, the visual spectrum. And uh, I have a note here I want to. Uh, this image is, was a painting by Vasily Kandinsky, who is known for, in Western art, creating the first serious abstract paintings. Kandinsky was both a violinist and a visual artist, and prior to this, he'd done a lot of relatively conventional landscapes and expressionistic landscapes, but he worked into abstraction partly because he possessed the ability uh, of synesthesia, which is the ability to uh, see sounds and to hear colors. And I've had a little bit of that in my own experience where if I'm kind of falling asleep and hear a siren going off, I see that siren in, in a pattern of colors. Um, and in a sense, the visual and the oral world, if you think of them abstractly, uh, they both involve the, the perception of color, intensity, duration, um, of, of, of frequencies in space. Uh, when, you, when you think about color being a spectrum, go back here a little bit, uh, and also when you hear sounds, they, all of music essentially, uh, and even uh, the lyrics of the songs have, have connotation, but it is, it, it is frequency, intensity, duration, and the color that the instrument produces that is how we hear sound. So that's a little primer on what I do for a living. Um, I have uh, been a walker and a wanderer, in a sense, and purposefully wandering my whole life. Uh, I'm going to show a few images of my paintings now. This is a really old painting that I did from memory of a walker uh, that I saw driving back from tuning pianos in coming back from Shano. I want to read a couple quotes of uh, Rebecca Solnit. I read a book of hers uh, a year or so ago called Wanderlust. And it's basically a history of walking. And uh, a lone walker is both present and detached from the world around, more than an audience, but less than a participant. Walking assuages or legitimizes this alienation. One is mildly disconnected because one is walking, not because one is incapable of connecting. And, and then uh, shortly after, she says, until the surroundings become important, the walk was just movement, not experience. And I kind of relate to that quote in hindsight because uh, going about where I live has been an important source for my own visual art practice. This is a pretty early painting, about 1990, of a sunrise from the hill behind Kmart, actually, here in Opaka. It's part of the triptych. This was in the um, former Tomorrow River Gallery in Amherst, where I had a couple of shows. So the three of them relate to each other. Uh, I started trying to involve my travels as a piano tuner as a source for my paintings. So I did a series called Road and Landscape. This is a very early one, probably 1992, a little bit later. And I usually do these in series of fours. Also, uh, a friend of mine, Ellen Connor, uh, owns this painting. And uh, it's from my vacationing up at Little Lake St. Germain, uh, where I wandered in a canoe, basically, <laughs> to an island. Um, this is an image from a series I painted, and I showed it at the Chez Marche called Roads I Travel. And uh, I showed this painting because it was purchased uh, through the Percent for Art program, which, uh, so it's in the uh, DOT building in Green Bay. Percent for Art was a program set up from the state that any government building had to set aside like one-tenth of one percent of the total budget to purchase art by, from living Wisconsin artists. And sadly, under our current governor, it no longer exists. Uh, another uh, painting of roadside travel. Uh, a few years ago, I, I did a, a travel, a wander to the Civil War sites of Antietam and Manassas, uh, Maryland. And this is a painting of the Antietam, the, the sacred ground at Antietam. Uh, it was a pivotal battle in, in the Civil War. That cleft in the hill was where Mac General McClellan marched the Union troops before battle. And I did probably about 20 paintings of the Civil War series. This is um, from Cumberland, Maryland on the Mason-Dixon line. Did a series of several paintings from it. 
And this was my show at Vermont College of Fine Arts in Montpelier, um, and showing mainly images of Wisconsin, uh, my area, my area where I live. And after I graduated, I did paintings of the foundry area, basically the town. This is of the railroad tracks near the foundry. And a series of wind turbines uh, near south of Fond du Lac, which you're all familiar with if you drive to Milwaukee. Opaca smokestacks in the foundry. And uh, another, this is a house near where Chief Opaca is buried, near Marion. These are about 30, 36 by 38 inches. Uh, four years ago, to this day, I was teaching art as an adjunct professor at UW Lacrosse, and this is my class. <laughs> and I love teaching at a university. Uh, sadly, the pay wasn't so great, so I wound up tuning pianos to, to keep the bankers happy. And uh, Abby Leifold at Leifold Music found out I was a pretty good piano tuner, so I started tuning there. And I still go back to lacrosse about every month or two. And uh, so I had a show at the Pump House called Ro uh, Postcard of Lacrosse. And oh, this was one of my students' work. Very yeah, fine wow. painting. Uh, so this is a similar to the, the show of 65 oil paintings and drawings at, uh, at the Pump House Regional Arts Center at Lacrosse. Um, view from the bluff and uh, view from Granddad's bluff. This is a painting from one of my walks around Wapaka called Twilight. And this is a painting uh, that I'll, I'll talk about this topic more because this is from the Baltic Sea uh, in uh, Poland right now. Um, and this was a scene that my grandmother may have seen as she left Europe in 1881, coming to America. Pomeranian tree and a Pomeranian landscape. Um, I probably developed my penchant for wandering from my father. Uh, this is an image, Georgia, you'll appreciate this. Uh, this is about 1958 when my dad was learning how to become a piano tuner and he was playing five or six nights a week. This is at the Shell Goko in Shano and uh, uh, Carl Knopf Combo. The gentleman on drums, Joy Rowe, was a great drummer. He died of a heart attack about five years after that. And my father never found a suitable replacement until he could train me. <laughs> uh, I, I played jazz drums my whole life since I was about uh, 12 and this is uh, my friend Tom McComb and Ben Hedquist and I at the uh, Rising Star Mill in Nelsonville. And I still play with this motley crew from time to time, uh, my Americana quartet hat pants. Uh, this is my wandering partner. You can ooh and ah if you so desire. Uh, Taj Mahal, we wander in the streets of Opaka three, four times a week. And uh, here we are in a recent snowstorm. These are a few shots of Opaka. It's, it's just a really beautiful place, I think. Um, this is the granite quarry. Mike, you know this well. Um, and uh, I, I, met, I show this slide because Mike and I have talked a little bit about this. There was a hobo village uh, back in the woods there in the Depression. And if you look very ar archaeologically, you can still perhaps find some remnants from that camp. Um, and it was disbanded by some denizens of Wapaka in the Depression. Um, but uh, there was a pretty vibrant village there at one time. And that's a very beautiful place. Um, I encourage you all to walk around the granite quarry. I show a couple images uh, from the Fisher Fallgatter Mill, which uh, is a beautiful building, probably not long for this world. Um, I used to rent the third floor from my friend Marcel Van Camp back in the 80s, and we had some great times there. It was the home of Wapaka Community Theater rehearsal. And uh, you see the beautiful chamfering of the beams. Uh, sadly, the uh, roof has been neglected and, and is condemned. So this entropic facade um, is, uh, you better enjoy it quickly because it's going to be coming dismantled in May. Um, makes me think of entropy a little bit. Um, digital technology tends to work and then it fails. There's no in-between. Uh, buildings, pianos, people, traditional technology, it has a lifespan. It, it has a prime of life, it's created, it has a prime of life, and then it slowly diminishes its ability. Kind of like if you're 59 or older like I am, you know about the entropic uh, uh, factors that go into uh, the human body. And uh, I think this is a, 
I've always been drawn to ruins, and, and I found find them very poetic. Uh, another shot of the mill in uh, in snowstorm, I believe. There's a few shots of Opaca from the, our Feast for the Eyes. This is the Opaca Country Club after a snowstorm this past winter. Opaca River. I also make vehicular wanders in my tuning. I, I tune all over central Wisconsin. Um, but I also made, uh, I've been connected with Milwaukee for 30 years. And this is my friend of 30 years, David Barnett, in his gallery. And he's represented me as an artist uh, for about 15 years. And, and I still tune his two grand pianos. Yeah. If you get to Milwaukee, you got to check it out. Because he has VRs and Rembrandts and Matisse's and just an amazing collection. I mean, I keep telling David, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to spend $30,000 in your place. And, and, uh, it would be amazing. Um, this house was built in 1892 by a pharmacist for $36,000 at a time when the average Milwaukee house was built for $3,000. It's a magnificent structure. It's state and prospect. This is a um, Howard Schroeder painting uh, with a couple of Matisse's there in the corner. This is inside the Barnett Gallery. Howard Schroeder was a, a color theory professor at UW-Milwaukee his whole career, and then he retired on Hatch Lake and did a series of absolutely gorgeous landscapes using his color knowledge. And David has about 15 of them in his gallery. And sadly, he died a couple of years after he retired. My friend Dean Jensen, um, who has a wonderful gallery on Water Street near the uh, Paps Theater. And uh, he was a speaker at the uh, Wapaka Book Fest last year. His book, Queen of the Air, is going to be turned into a feature film by Warner Brothers starring Scarlett Johansson. Uh, he's a very successful writer, as well as having one of the greatest galleries that I've ever seen. And I lived in New York for three years. Um, and he bats a thousand. And um, Milwaukee was recently rated one of the top ten art cities in the United States. And that's pretty amazing when you think that Milwaukee's population is probably 50th. Uh, so it really has some really, it has a lot of good art galleries and art activity going on. My friend Dave Nick, who's a Milwaukee painter who paints paintings like this. This is Sunrise on Lake Michigan, a series he did while living in a tent during the lunar cycle in both the Wisconsin Lake Michigan shore and the Michigan Lake Michigan shore. And this is an amazing show of paintings, uh, all very similar to this, painted during the evening with flashlights on the shores, sleeping in a tent. The Calatrava edition. Do visit the Milwaukee Art Museum. It's an amazing collection. This is as beautiful a painting as you'll see anywhere. It's by Pierre Bonnard, about the turn of the century, Woman in the Hat. Just a few examples. Uh, Chuck Close, Portrait of Jackie Onassis, Larger Than Life. And there's a detail of it. Uh, Chuck Close is known as being a photorealist and uh, based upon this gridded photograph, which is quite small in size. Uh, installation of suspended stones, very beautiful piece. I also have made wanders out east. Uh, this is in uh, the New York Thruway going through uh, New York State during the autumn of this last year. Uh, actually, this talk gave me an excuse to drive to Gloucester, Boston, New York to shoot a painting. So thank you, Winchester Academy. Um, this is a, a, the Mansard House on, in Rocky Neck, uh, Gloucester, from the exact site that Edward Hopper painted it. Um, many, many years ago. I don't have the, the painting, uh, but I have this very similar one. And Hopper was uh, a master of painting Victorian architecture. Uh, this is a Gloucester uh, rail. Uh, this is the uh, oldest uh, facility for servicing boats. And when I walked around Gloucester at 6.30 in the morning, I talked to lobster fishermen before they went out. Gloucester was where Perfect Storm was filmed. And uh, it's, it's an old fishing port. And they service these fishing boats, you know, change the propellers, clean the barnacles off, do whatever fishing boats need. This is a native son, Martin Johnson Heed. And there's a great little museum called the Cape Man Museum in Gloucester where they have probably 60 Martin Johnson Heed paintings. Another example of his. Uh, New York. I spent three years at the New York Studio School, uh, which was the old Whitney Museum of American Art. And uh, it was started about 1962 by young art students not wanting the conventional art education. There was no degree, no grades. You basically worked with professional artists in critiques and worked in your studio. And 
I actually painted that sign about 1980 as a work study project. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great place to be for a while. There's a shot of me in front of the Freedom Tower. And I show this image. This is the, boarding, the first boarding house I stayed in in New York in 1980, where I had very little money. I rented one of the top a rooms in the top floor. It was an eight by 10 room for $150 a month. Wow. It had no kitchen, uh, no elevator, uh, one bathroom for the floor. The shower usually didn't work. And um, the interesting thing was, right before that, the New York State had a budget crunch, and they just, the politicians decided to shut uh, down most of the mental health institutions. And they basically gave the former residents a check for $400 and said, good luck. And uh, so a number of my neighbors were former um, residents of mental health institutions. And uh, my, my next door neighbor, who I really got fond of, but she lived on cat food. And, but she regularly had dinner with Paul Newman um, in her mind. And I, I, I saw her a couple months after I moved out, and she was a bad person. And probably did not live long after, after that. Uh, the Salvador Dali painting in New York, uh, Edward Hopper. Go through these fairly quickly because I do want to allow time for discussion. This is a Freedom Tower. Um, and when I first went to New York, I stayed with a friend in Soho, and we used to sit scotch late at night, watch the 747s flying around the World Trade Center. And little did we know that one day two of them would bring those towers down. This is a melted I beam in the uh, memorial at Ground Zero that shows. <coughs> In a dramatic visual image, I think. Berlin, flying in, one of the, one of the great wanders of my life, uh, was last summer. And I've always wanted to visit uh, Berlin and visit the home of my great grandparents. Um, a shot from my hotel on the Karl Marx Straße looking east, no, looking west. This was from former East Berlin. And Berlin's a very dynamic city, a lot of building. You'll notice there's no skyscrapers, and that's pretty typical of all European cities. Um, they're, they, it's just very unlike the American pension for going vertical. This is the um, uh, senior moment here, Bundestag, uh, the uh, go government building which was recreated uh, in Berlin after re reunification, uh, Den Deutsche Volk. Reichstag, thank you. It was a senior moment. There is the Brandenburg Gate, uh, which is uh, the end of the Unter den Linden uh, and leading into the uh, Tiergarten Park, one of the great parks of the world. And of course, it, it's an iconic image where the, during World War II, as the Russian troops were moving in, there was a swastika on the top of the carriage, and it was blown off by, very justly by the Russian howitzers. This is a, a church near the uh, zoological garden that was not yet restored from the Allied. Pictures of Berlin and Stettin, where my, uh, my relatives lived, were, looked like total desolation uh, after World War II. It was systematic bombing of every German city, over 150,000 by the uh, RAF and the USAF, and again, justifiable, but yet it, great um, destruction. This is the... Um, Victory Tower, which was built in the middle of the Tiergarten uh, during the reign of Frederick the Great, and uh, it, it's been, you know, damaged and restored. Uh, now it's more almost like a peace monument. Recently, the Rolling Stones, Chrissy Hine, the Pretenders, it, it, it's a center for um, concerts in, in Berlin. And there's a view from the, I walked up the 17 flights of stairs to the top, and that's a view down the Unter den Linden through the Tiergarten. I believe it's in one of the major avenues. The, one of the uh, best days of my trip in Europe was renting a bike and just wandering around Berlin with it. And uh, I, I didn't want to leave, so I, I was in the Tiergarten at night, about 10 o'clock before I had to fly back. And it was very cool vibe. I mean, it's a little, I wouldn't do that in Central Park, I don't think. Um, but you just don't feel, I didn't feel like there was a threat of violence um, or, or in the major European cities I've been in. That's a, uh, the river spray in the Tiergarten from the Rosa Luxemburg Bridge. And I want to read a quote of one of my favorite writers, Walter Benjamin. And uh, Walter Benjamin is known as probably one of the greatest cultural critics of the 20th century and certainly one of the great writers and thinkers. 
he had the misfortune of being a Marxist Jew uh, living during the, um, the Third Reich. Uh, so he met his end on the shores of Spain, waiting for uh, a ship to freedom to England while the Gestapo was closing in on him. But he wrote this book uh, in his a Berlin Chronicle of 1932. <laughs> Not to find one's way in a city may well be uninteresting and banal. It requires ignorance, nothing more. But to lose oneself in a city, as one loses oneself in a forest, that calls for a different schooling. Then signboards and street names, passerbys, roofs, kiosks, and bars must speak to the wanderer like a crackling twig under his feet in the forest, the startling call of a bittern in the distance, like the sudden stillness of a clearing with a lily standing erect at its center. I think I had that experience coming upon the sculpture. I was just wandering and not knowing where I was going. Um, and this was created by a member of the Kinder Transport. And in German it says, trains to, to life, trains to death. And it was set up by the Red Cross in the, in the late 30s. And one out of 10 Jewish children, would, if, they, if they could find a family in England that would sponsor them, would, would take a train to England and a new life, leaving their parents behind, of course. Uh, but most of the trains wound up going to the camps. And it's a very poignant sculpture uh, created by one of the members of the Kinder Transport who did find a new life and a career as a sculptor in England. And it's very beautiful. Uh, this is a Holocaust memorial uh, right near the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. This is uh, the Peace Pavilion off the Unter den Linden. This is uh, a sculpture by the great Berlin uh, artist and pacifist Katja Kallwitz. And uh, it's a monument to the victims of war and tyranny. And we don't have time to read this, but it's a very powerful uh, statement in the Peace Pavilion. Part of the reason for my trip was to visit this area. Uh, all of my great-grandparents were born near the city of Szczecin, which was a city in Germany. It's now in modern Poland. It's called Szczecin. My Polish is any good. Um, and uh, when I was in Europe in 83, I couldn't go here because it was behind the Iron Curtain. And I really wanted to go back to visit the land that my grandmother left in 1881. And here's a picture of my grandmother with my, yours truly, age year and a half. And my grandmother lived with us. She was bilingual and she stayed in contact with her cousin in Stettin her whole life. And uh, her cousin, Alvin Neubauer, owned an art gallery and an art supply store in Chatine until the end of World War II when the Russian troops uh, rec or claimed the city. This is a picture of Chatine around 1881, about the time my grandmother left. And uh, notice the, the church, because it still stands to this day. I have pictures of it. When I visited in 1983, 1983, excuse me, uh, I spent two weekends with this gentleman, Axel Neubauer. He was a re uh, architecture professor at the University of Ulm, and he had a lot of great tales to tell. Uh, and he was the son of my grandmother's cousin. Uh, he was being trained in 1945 to fly a Messerschmitt Comet, which, I don't know if you're a buff of World War II uh, history, but it was basically a wood-winged rocket that would go up to 30,000 feet in five minutes and then coast down and with its nose cannon try and shoot down as many B-17s as they could which were obliterating the German cities. Um, they were basically a suicide plane. Even the Luftwaffe would not allow their pilots to fly until their 16th birthday. So uh, he lived to tell the tale. He told me that immediately when the war ended, first thing he did was burn his German uniform Second thing was he became a, a member of the Communist Party because everyone wanted to get as far away from fascism as they possibly could. And the third thing he did is he scraped together the, as much money as he could to buy a used motorcycle. And he went bumming around Europe to look for his parents. And uh, during the, uh, after the war, uh, his parents were refugees wandering around uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, because he was an artist, he would do oil paintings uh, and sell them to GIs. And so we sent care packages of coffee, tobacco, oil paints, and brushes. And in gratitude, they would send art back to us. And this is a drawing that uh, Elvin Newbar did of my mother in 1947. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my prized possessions mm -hmm. this day. This is Stettin today, or Skachin, Poland today, the, notice the church. 
the beautiful 12th century Polish, Polish Catholic Church. Um, just a little bit of a wandering around uh, Szczecin. This is a Roman fortification of the second century. Streets of Szczecin. And yes, the land of my great grandparents was very adept at removing the Polish and Jewish and uh, gypsy and leftist and homosexual population. Uh, this is in the, in the Szczecin Museum. Um, I was told that I should wander around the uh, Skitchin Cemetery. It was the third largest necropolis in Europe, and very beautiful, massive place. Uh, just went for seemingly for miles, and I thought that perhaps I might find some of my relatives there. But uh, alas, all the markers were bulldozed after World War II, uh, and. Uh, the, it was repopulated by Polish markers. After the war, everyone was very poor, so they would use a, a cedar uh, cross with a dime store crucifix to mark their relatives. There were a few German uh, markers around the periphery, most of them with Jewish families that were left, that were spared the bulldozer. And this is this was some of the building material that they used the markers with. I'm going to move quickly here because time is going. Uh, this was my walk from... Um, I, I took the train to Schweinisch, which is a German city of Schweinemunde, and uh, it was a resort town. And I knew I wanted to walk to the mouth of the Oder River, because that was the last site that my grandmother saw when she left Europe in 1881. There were lots of interesting uh, military uh, artifacts. This was a World War II era pillbox, probably a Prussian fortification that was turned into a restaurant. You can see the rocket left there. It was a, another world, uh, probably a Wehrmacht uh, fortification. If you controlled the river, you controlled all the cities upstream from it. And that's why it was so militarily important. This uh, almost castle-like structure went back to the 18th century. It was built upon and appropriated by different armies at different times. You can see the size of it by the scale of the people. Turrets. When I got to the mouth, it was a party. There were like hundreds of people drinking wine, playing frisbee. Uh, there were also a lot of European uh, millennial youth living on the shores, and there was a Russian Orthodox uh, commune and all kinds of cool things. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Usse, or the Baltic Sea, looking in the chalk coast of Reagan. Mm -hmm. Amsterdam, mm -hmm. the Rijksmuseum, which uh, we'll talk about the Rembrandts and Vermeers there, one of the great museums of the world, mm -hmm. the beautiful canals and a little bit of the architecture. Um, Amsterdam is, was really uh, developed in the 16th and 17th century, became one of the world's uh, great trading centers. This is The Hague, which is the Dutch capital, and also the home of the world court. And this is the Maritus, which ho also hosts many of the Vermeers and Rembrandts. And these two museums were really a focal point of my trip to Europe, to see these paintings firsthand. Uh, the images I'm going to show shortly, uh, they're, they're like a poor second best to seeing paintings in real life because you, you really miss the, the layering, the depth of the color, the, the brushwork is, is often lost. Uh, Marit um, owned or was a baron of the sugar business in Holland, and that's how he acquired his fortune. A quick trip, train trip to Italy, to Bologna, which these towers were built in the 12th century was a walled city, never was conquered, and uh, the Bolognese uh, had marksman sh uh, crossbow uh, shooters up in these towers, and no army really wanted to mess with Bologna. Even during the Mussolini era, Bologna had a certain degree of autonomy that other Italian cities did not have. The beautiful arcaded sidewalk with terrazzo sidewalks um, in, the, in the city center, which goes for miles. This is a, a residence in the center plaza. I mean, you can walk right up there, sit on the bench, and people live inside these walls. Uh, another Roman fortification of the second century. And my trip there was uh, to visit the uh, artist Giorgio Morandi, one of my favorite painters of all time. And uh, this is his studio. And this is a, a, a photograph of Morandi looking into still life objects. And, I'll just quickly share this still life, which is in the Minneapolis Institute of the Arts. A quote from Morandi, I believe that nothing can be more abstract, more unreal, 
than what we actually see. <laughs> and I think that's a very uh, beautiful quote. And, and he spent his whole life literally painting these very simple objects, and they're absolutely gorgeous. If you're interested, Google him, and, and you'll have a treat for the eyes. Um, I believe that um, the paintings of Rembrandt and Vermeer, and I know we have to go through these pretty quickly, um, are a real high point in the tradition of, of Western art. Of, this was from the Lascaux cave, painted about 17,000 years ago, uh, which probably serves some kind of a mythic rite of the hunt by whoever painted these images on the walls. Back uh, before there were TVs or even canvases, they had the, the, the walls of caves to uh, apply paint to. And I think it goes to the human urge to create images on a flat surface. This is an early Rembrandt painting. Uh, I have a few notes here that I have to refer to. Rembrandt was born in 1606 in Leiden, and in 1661 he moved to Amsterdam. This is um, a 1928 self-portrait in the Rijksmuseum. And Rembrandt painted self-portraits his entire life, a 40-year soliloquy, one of the great self-portraitists of all times. Um, and his reputation was almost nil up until the 19th century romantics rediscovered him based upon his uncompromising approach to the self-portrait. Um, he had great success in midlife, and then his paintings fell out of favor. His wife died. His mistress sued him for every penny he had. He lost his house. He lost almost all of his possessions and died relatively penniless, and uh, in, not in favor because the trend of painting went towards more color, flashier uh, style of painting. This is Leiden, about the time Rembrandt was born. Not a big city. It, Rembrandt was born into the middle class, maybe lower middle class, a mill workers, a miller's son. And uh, this is an early called uh, Artist in His Studio, and this is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, it's, it's amazing because he also kind of pays attention to the entropy of the studio, the, the Rhine salt water creeping up through the plaster. And uh, I, I love the way that that white line along the easel sets the foremost position of the painting in space, and everything recedes from it. Rembrandt was, at an early age, a real master of composition and uh, painting. A little detail of the... Uh... This is uh, called Self-Portrait in a Gorget. Uh, this was a time when Holland was still fighting a war of independence with Spain, so militarism was in vogue, and hence a little hint of armor. It also speaks to Rembrandt's uh, penchant for theater, and you'll see more of this in later images, uh, in dressing up, in being, having a persona of being an everyman, in a, so to speak. Um, this is a very famous painting, uh, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tull. It's in the Maritu. It's a fairly large painting. And uh, upon his death, <laughs> this is kind of interesting, the, uh, in a pickle jar, the forearm of the cadaver in this painting was found in Rembrandt's possession, one of the few things that he kept through all of his bankruptcies. And uh, uh, there, in this painting, uh, Rembrandt was paid 100 guilders a head. And Amsterdam was a corporate town. Uh, you had to make money there, kind of like New York today. And uh, everybody paid uh, for this. And uh, it was a, a group portrait was like really the better, bread and butter of ambitious painters, uh, both for a source of income and for advertising their skills. In this painting, Rembrandt solved two contradictory tasks, providing a likeness of the sitters and to make a coherent statement of the collective identity of the group, uh, the inner and outer reality. And Rembrandt went at great lengths to get the tone right of the cadaver. And if you've ever painted, you know how tricky this is. Um, to, to contrast the skin tone with the living, paying uh, members of this group. And uh, it was really unprecedented to reveal the cadaver's face at this time, too. There were other paintings of anatomy lessons, but this is probably the most in-your-face at the time. And it's really quite an amazing painting to see it firsthand. This is a man in oriental dress. It's in the New York Metropolitan Museum. Quite a large uh, historical portrait. And he, Rembrandt, really invented the historical portrait uh, and gave it the dynamism and the energy of history paintings. And this was a commissioned likeness, again, paying the rent, uh, of, of somebody who wanted to be get up, 
be gotten up, be dressed in oriental garb. And, and Rembrandt was um, really famous for dramatizing the, hum, the humdrum, and it separated him from conventional portrait painters. This is woman in the portrait of a woman with a fan in the Metropolitan, where he makes an ostensibly still woman kind of alive with tension and with the twist of her torso. And uh, the, the lace of her collar is just an amazing feat of painting. And again, you have to see this firsthand to truly appreciate all the mastery of, of Rembrandt's brush. I love this painting. It's uh, called Portrait of Hermann Dumer, painted in 1640. It's in the Metropolitan. And uh, Dumer was a maker of picture frames, born in Germany, not well-to-do, probably a member of the lower middle class. And, and Rembrandt probably painted this because he was his friend. Uh, his son, uh, he took on as an apprentice. And it, it it's, uh, shows Rembrandt's instinctive ability to inject drama into simplicity and maintain the integrity of the subject. And he wasn't like, uh, you know, trying to rip off or rattle off something quick. He really put his whole heart and soul into this painting. This is arguably one of the most famous paintings of Western art. It's called The Night Watch. And it's in the Rijksmuseum. It's uh, very large, as you can see from the, the real person's head, which I, from my photograph. And um, in Calvinist Amsterdam in 1640, uh, the cathedral had really been replaced by the town hall as a uh, bastion of civic values. Uh, citizen soldiers, the shooter, represented these values, and they were the heroic defenders of Dutch towns. Um, basically, uh, a bulwark against the despotic pretensions of princes, both foreign and domestic. And the uh, Night Watch was really open to any citizens, so it's a cr real cross-section of the population of Amsterdam. And Rembrandt was paid 100 guilders per sitter, uh, 1,600 in all, but he got 200 for the top billing guys, uh, uh, banning coke and Lieutenant Willem von Reutenberg, who paid 200 guilders apiece. And they, you know, they were the top dogs in this uh, crew. Um, the, the Night Watch were legitimate defenders. They fought in the war against Spain. Uh, and uh, this was a coveted commission to get one of these uh, commissions to, paint, to do a painting in the town hall, and not easy to do. Um, a strong element of the painting's power especially in the context of its time, is the breadth of its human ensemble. It was really a microcosm of not just the militia, but the whole team in the city of Amsterdam. And you know, I'll show a few details. Uh, this was a copy made by Garrick London's in 17, 1650, after it was painted. And you can see how the original was cropped off at the top and the left side. Uh, you can notice the, the shadow of uh, Banning Coke's supremacy over the other fellow, because his shadow is cast, and he was the leader of the Night Watch. Uh, great assemblage of characters, um, the dog, the drummer, kind of looks like Main Street Wapaka on Saturday night. <laughs> uh, again, the shadow on the uh, tanned outfit. I just love these details. I mean, it's a painting you literally spent hours in front of. And that might be Rembrandt's daughter as a model. Notice the chicken hanging from her belt. It might be supper. This is thought of as a portrait of Rembrandt, but nobody knows for sure. Uh, this is a large cell portrait in the Frick Museum in New York, and, and this is from a uh, reproduction because they, Frick does not allow photography, but this painting was done at the lowest point of Rembrandt's life. He had just filed bankruptcy, his wife had died, Nobody was buying his paintings, and yet he sits like a king with his painting wall as a scepter, a scepter of his rule, and no trace of self-pity. This is a self-portrait as the Apostle St. Paul, and this was done later in Rembrandt's life. Again, he was quite poor, and you probably could think that he related to St. Paul, who preached that the law was anathema to grace and salvation that it really didn't matter, that the worth of a person was in their heart, not in how they um, upheld the wall or their material possessions. Uh, this is the uh, oath swearing of Claudius Civilius, who was a kind of like a Roman Braveheart uh, who 
banded together a bunch of tribes. And this was a botched commission. It was originally 20 feet wide. And it, it's much smaller than that now. Rembrandt cut it down. He butchered his own painting to try and sell it to a homeowner so it would fit inside because he really needed to pay the rent. Yeah. And still, this is a very um, revolutionary painting for its time. It, the brushwork, the bravura is just amazing. The sense of light, the again, the whole um, assemblage of characters. Uh, my dad used to smoke these. <laughs> I don't think Rembrandt got any residuals or commissions, but this was Rembrandt's last major group commission. It's called uh, the Stalemeisters. And the Stalemeisters uh, inspected the cloth in Amsterdam, which was really one of the major exports of, of Holland at the time. They made sure that the cloth was up to snuff. And um, again, a paid commission, probably his last one. And he solved the problem of having the individual likenesses and yet having them work as a coherent whole. Um, the light falling on that diagonal tabletop is really extraordinary. That show the, see the thick impasto of paint. And this is uh, the Jewish bride. It's known as that. Uh, it's the last painting I'm going to show. Two years before Rembrandt died, 1667. It may, the male figure may have been his son Titus. Uh, it probably refers to the Old Testament uh, marriage of Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis 26.8. The biographer Christopher Wright, Christopher White states that this is one of the greatest expressions of the tender fusion of spiritual and physical life, love in the history of painting. And sadly, I'm going to have to go through Vermeer really quickly. This is one of Rembrandt's students, Carl Fabricius, The Goldfinch, which is a novel. Uh, the German painter Adolf Meinzel, uh, Rembrandt's painterliness certainly show. Lucien Freud, Sigmund Freud's grandson, uh, recently died a year ago, and his paintings were selling for tens of millions of dollars upon his death. And Arnold Friedman, a uh, very painterly painter still living to this day. I am the great Chicagoan uh, Ivan Albright, who uh, won the commission to paint the painting for the picture Portrait of Dorian Gray in the 1947 film, and created this amazing series of self-portraits in the last two years of his life as he was declining in health. Uh, Carl Fabricius was perhaps Vermeer's teacher, and uh, he would be a household name had he not died in a gunpowder explosion on the streets of Delft while he was painting. And this shows the, um, this is one of his paintings. And uh, a detail of the church. I show this because he probably, like Vermeer, employed a camera obscura. Uh, this shows the Neukirk in Delft with a conventional lens and then with a concave lens like a camera obscura would be employed. This is a town of Delft about when Vermeer was born. In fact, he was born where that X is at the Flying Fox Tavern. It'd be a great name for a tavern in Wakanda. Um, camera Obscura, early drawing, where it basically takes the rays of light and creates an inverted image on a flat surface in a darkened room. This is a uh, Camera Obscura similar to the one Vermeer may have employed in his paintings. This is the first photograph. I just showed this. Um, this early painting, uh, let's read one quick quote of Lawrence Gowing. The work of Johannes Vermeer is a slender and perfect plume thrown up by the wave of Dutch painting at its crest. For a moment, it seems like the massive tide pauses. And the suspension of time in Vermeer is one of, for me, the most amazing aspects of, of his work as a visual artist. This is called A Girl Asleep, uh, 1657 in the Metropolitan. And um, emblematic literature was in vogue in Holland, and this was a traditional uh, image of sloth. However, x-rays reveal that there was a man standing in the corridor and there was also a dog. So it may have been melancholy. It may have uh, been, you know, not an image of sloth, but a more sympathetic portrayal. Um, you can't, Vermeer is never obvious with the, um, I guess, the context of, of this is a view of a street in Delft. It's a very small painting. Uh, Vermeer was starting to learn how to use the effects of light. And uh, he uses thick impasto uh, to create, to mimic some of the textures of the buildings. And I will be going through these quickly. Uh, this is a milkmaid. 
It's really unprecedented in, in Dutch art. There's no painting like this before. Um, notice the very dark silhouette of the figure with the bright white against it. There's actually a line of pure white paint right along the darkness. Mm -hmm. And note the mousetrap and the tiles on the floor. Mm -hmm. This is the view of Delft. Uh, truly worth the trip for me to see this painting at the Maritus. Marcel Proust, uh, the, the French writer, the author of Remembrance of Things Past, stated, this is the most beautiful painting I have ever seen. Another quote I love of his that is apropos, says, the real voyage of discovery consists in not seeking new landscapes, but in having a new eye. And I think this really represents that. He probably used a camera obscura in this because the color intensities are a little bit more, you know, vibrant than you see with your natural vision. This is a detail of it. You can see the texture. Uh, this is a painting that, Tim's, that was recreated in Tim's Vermeer. It's called The Music Lesson, and in this, it, it's, in the, um, it's in the Queen's Mansion in London, so it's hard to see. If you're a fan of Vermeer, definitely check out Tim's Vermeer. It's an amazing uh, documentary film. And um, all the elements are conceived of patterns in this painting, very much like a, a Pete Mondrian, 20th century abstract painter. And uh, some interesting things, you can see Vermeer's paint box and easel in the mirror, and in the painting, her head is straight ahead, but in the mirror, her head is twisted toward the gentleman. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the uh, border of the clavecin is wider to the right of her head than to the left. All these little things uh, <laughs> are fascinating to see in Vermeer's works. This is uh, a woman in blue reading a letter in the Rijksmuseum, a moment of life encapsulated by paint. And this is a woman with a lute in the Metropolitan. And he employs the device of a barrier between the figure and the viewer to enhance the sense of privacy that the figure is experiencing. This is probably the reason for my talk. Girl with the pearl earring and the Maritus. And, um, this painting is, for me, like going back three centuries and, and seeing this visage of a beautiful young woman uh, just totally frozen in time. That's the best way I can describe the experience. <coughs> And uh, it's unusual for Vermeer to use a dark background against a figure, but it, it makes all of the brighter colors pop out at you. Here's a, a little bit of a detail of the face. Uh, this is the Elizabeth Stewart Gardner collection in Boston. And I show this because this, I spent hours in front of this painting when I lived in New York. Um, it's called the, the Music Lesson. And uh, it's at large. It was stolen around 1990. And it's, Again, Vermeer is ambiguous in his moralizing because the, the painting at the right is called the Procurus by Braburin. The Procurus is like a pimp, so to speak. And, uh, but the uh, calm tranquility and seriousness of the trio kind of belies a licentious you know, implication of that. So you never really know with Vermeer. This is one of the most beautiful paintings as well. It's a girl with the red hat in the National Gallery. And, Note the, the greenish tint of the shadow and the, the orange light reflected from the red of the hat. Interesting thing is the, the finials of the chair should be facing the other way. So who knows what that was about. This is a young woman in the Metropolitan Museum, and I've also spent a lot of time in front of this painting. Uh, a lot of critics think that Vermeer's powers were diminishing about this time. This was near the end of his life. And he also died bankrupt. In fact, his baker wound up uh, owning 13 of his paintings to, to settle his bills. Um, and uh, Vermeer was not the best provider for his eight children and wife, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but at this, in this painting, uh, Vermeer probably had the highest percentage of masterpieces of any artist in the history of Western art. But this one probably isn't one of them. This was likely a commission painting for the Jesuits at a time when Vermeer was very, very poor. And so he took this commission not really feeling um, like this was his forte. It kind of seal, seems silly and pretentious compared with his more poetic works like, like this one. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to show a few images of his ancestors in a way. This is Robert Bechtel. <laughs> and one of my uh, favorite 
a couple of my favorite living artists, Via Selmans. This is an early painting of her heater in her studio. And an absolutely gorgeous painting by the German Gerhard Richter in the Museum of Modern Art uh, called Meadowland. It's about 45 by 45 inches. And, and uh, Richter used photographs uh, for some of his paintings. I'll finish with a quote of his. I'm not trying to imitate a photograph. I'm trying to make one. And if I disregard the assumption that a photograph is a piece of paper exposed to light, then I am practicing photography by other means. I'm not producing paintings that remind you of a photograph, but I'm producing photographs. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions, five or 10. Well, raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you and everybody will hear your question or comment. Yes. Do you think it's possible when you look at Rembrandt's paintings that he might have been a <coughs> yellow colored line? That's a good question. I, I had not thought of that. I, I, my own feeling as a painter myself is that he found that the potential of, of a more limited palette was, gave him an ability for painterliness and for sculptural effects. Um, Vermeer is very much a colorist. You know, you can see the fullness of the color. In Rembrandt, you don't see that. He uses ochres and uh, siennas. Um, but I, I don't know that he would be colored by it. I think it's just what he chose to do. And the theme, you know, the, the humanity in Rembrandt is a big part. I mean, his I mean, I just showed a very small sample of his total production. He was very involved in uh, the great themes of, of uh, the Bible. And uh, he was a humanist. And uh, I think the color maybe got in the way. Well, I don't think it was what he was about. But that's a great question, and he maybe he, he didn't see color the way other people do. Yes. Yeah, I know it's your wanderings with an A, and it's wonderful. But it is your wanderings with an O that make you so good because you bring one <laughs> Thank you. You couldn't have said anything nicer. <laughs> I really appreciate. I wonder as yes. Wonder. What, what the questions up here are. Kevin, thank you so much for your talk. And I'm just wondering, going back to your piano tuning, yes. all those thousands of pianos, what's the strangest thing you ever found in one other than <laughs> dust and mouse turds? Would it be legal or illegal? <laughs> I have two. We don't have to um, names. <laughs> I found one bag of illegal substance in a piano action one time that was blocking a bank of of hammers from striking the strings. Oh, and the other interesting thing, it was a doctor's wife in Appleton, and I had to pull out the kneeboard in the bottom to adjust the pedals, and I found a bag of credit cards hanging in a, in a like a, a, a glad bag. And I called the woman up because I said, did you know there's a bag of credit cards inside your piano? And she said, oh yes. My husband told me I had to cut them up with the scissors, but I didn't have the heart to do it, so I hid them <laughs> inside the piano. <laughs> Those are both true stories. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes? Can I give a commercial for a real live artist? You bet. <laughs> the Wapaka Art Show is on at the Expo Center right now. It'll be on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 to 6, and Friday from 10 to 2. Thank and you. I think it's really nice this year. And Kevin played Saturday night. It was um, Kevin played Saturday night. It was really great. It was a nice. So next year on Saturday night, they always have a, a open house kind of a premiere night. They call it. Keep the information. Oh, okay. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's from 10 a.m. to 6. Friday from 10 to 2. And the art. There's really some nice artists this year. It's free. It's free to get in. And if you want to buy something, it's cheap because the artists are still alive. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. I, I wanted to say a friend of mine um, on, on her Facebook site, had, and I shared, I shared it. it, it was a picture of a Rene Magritte painting, and it said, buy art from living artists, the dead ones don't need the money. <laughs> Very true. Yes? The view of Delft, that's in the Maritus, in, in The Hague. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we should give our speaker a great round of applause. I sincerely thank you all for coming. You were great. And I sincerely thank the Winchester Academy. And congratulations on 25 great years. And may you have 
1,025 more. 